George Moore Library here in Richmond, Texas. And today we have a speaker, Dr. Nicholas Cox. He is in the history department at the, the um, Houston Community College. He's also on the uh, historical commission for the state of Texas. This gentleman is a very knowledgeable individual. He just speaks and talks and he stands there and talks about the dates and times and the people that manned the cannons and, and at what time they started the attack and who led the charges and um, the sharpshooters and, and all this information that I would have 5,000 three by five cars and he stands there with nothing in his hands, but it's all in his mind. This gentleman is a fascinating speaker, a very novel individual, and he is a joy to listen to. So please welcome Dr. Cox and thank you, sir. Uh, Don and Christina, thank you guys very much. Um, as Don said, I have been presenting some topics related to Texas history at the various campus branches in Fort Bend for a, at least once or twice a semester for six or seven years now. And I, I do really sincerely miss being able to do that in person and talking to you guys all at the same time. Um, hopefully we can safely get back together in the libraries and do this in person. I'd be happy to see you guys all whenever we can do that. Um, I also I also want to thank Don for that incredible kind words. That's a uh, some uh, some really appreciated compliments there. I um, I do not have any special secret. Uh, the knowledge that I, I share with you guys comes uh, not through any magic tricks or having a, a whole bunch of note cards, but because I talk about this stuff uh, at HCC all the time. Right, my my primary job is teaching U.S. and Texas history at the community college. Um, I teach at the campus in Stafford. I live in Sugarland. Uh, my children go to Fort Bend ISD schools, um, and I try to be active in the Fort Bend community whenever possible when talking about historical events. Um, but as all I think Texas students and Texans know, uh, yesterday was April 21st, the anniversary of the Battle of San Jacinto. And typically every March or April when the month of the anniversaries roll around, uh, Don will ask me to speak about the Alamo or speak about the Battle of San Jacinto. Um, and today, I think what we'll do is we'll kind of talk in an overview about the uh, Texas Revolution in general. And so I want to start by um, showing you this first image here, which should be a very familiar image to most people in Texas. Uh, this is, of course, the Alamo. Now, you will notice it is romantically drawn here with its battle scars and damage done after the battle at the Alamo. Um, but like the Alamo itself, the Texas Revolution really does kind of loom large over the history of the state. It's an essential sort of story that becomes a touchstone for some of the mythical as well as historical development of ties to Texas, uh, ties sometimes of patriotism, sometimes of nationalism. Sometimes the stories we tell about Texas are more history, sometimes they're more mythology. Uh, but the Texas Revolution has always been central to that story since the revolution concluded. Now, when I start talking about the Texas Revolution with my students, I often want to start with a little bit of geography. I want people in my classes or in my presentations to understand the places that I'll be talking about today. So let me show you a quick map of the Texas landscape during the time of the Texas Revolution. You're gonna see a lot of cities on this map that are familiar to you. Um, cities like Houston actually that are established after the revolution. But if you are familiar with Houston here, Austin here, San Antonio here, most people would tell you that if you wanna get from Houston to San Antonio, you just hop onto I-10. Or if you want to get up to East Texas and visit Nacogdoches, you take the freeways straight north. But what students and people living in Texas today often don't think about is the river system impact on settlement, on colony building, and of course on the Texas Revolutionary War itself. Uh, people living in and around Harrisburg or Houston today, uh, they did not hop on I-10, right? There were ox carts and wagon carts and trails that took them from one town on one river to the next. And I, what I really want people to think about in this presentation today are some of the major sites of conflict during the Texas Revolution. So I will draw your attention to some of the earliest important cities. Most of these cities that I'm talking about at this moment were established by the Spanish in Texas in the 1700s. 
You've got towns like Nacogdoches, where the Spanish established a mission to the Caddo Indians uh, as early as the 1670s and 1680s. Um, you've got the town of San Antonio in the county of Bear. That also was a central activity of Spanish missionary activity. Down the river from San Antonio, you'll see a major community at Goliad and on the Guadalupe River at Gonzales. These will both figure prominently in the early battles of the Texas Revolution. But most of the Anglo colonists who participated in the revolt lived on the Brazos River or Colorado Rivers. Uh, and it is there in the Brazos and Colorado Rivers that we really should start talking about uh, the kind of foundations for discontent in Texas by the American settlements who established themselves there under Spanish and Mexican rule in the 1820s. Slight bit of background here before we talk about the revolution itself. In the 1810s and 1820s, Mexico went through a pretty traumatic independence revolution. And after 1821, when Mexico secured its independence from Spain, they did decide to continue Spanish policies of attracting immigrants into Texas. It was a far northern frontier. It was close to the U.S. border. There was a widespread presence of Apache and Comanche Indians. And the Spanish and then Mexican governments believed that the quickest way to secure the hold on Texas was to increase the population and economic development in the region. Now, Spain and Mexico certainly would have preferred Spanish immigrants or Mexican migrants to move into the region, but in the absence, in the absence of large numbers of Spanish or Mexican residents living in Texas, they opened it up to international immigration. Once again, the preference was Catholics from Europe. You will see a lot of Catholics coming from Germany, France, or Ireland, the Netherlands, but primarily and overwhelmingly, the population that was most likely to move into Texas happened to be people from the United States. And that's where we really start talking about the Stephen F. Austin colonies. Now, Stephen F. Austin established his homestead at San Felipe on the Brazos River, and he secured authorization from the Spanish and later Mexican governments to bring more Anglo-American or white American settlements into the colonies. They typically settled down the Brazos and Colorado rivers into Fort Bend and Galveston County, down through Wharton and Matagorda County. But over time, as the 1820s passed, the American colonists pushed further up into Austin's second sort of colonial settlement region. Uh, his empresario contracts permitted him to bring settlers in and manage the real estate transactions as American settlers became Mexican nationals. But in addition to these Brazos and Colorado colonies, by the late 1820s and early 1830s, you start to see a lot of Americans settling north of Galveston and Trinity Bay. Um, they're particularly pushing up the Trinity and Liberty Rivers, and this is creating a community of Anglo-American settlement stretching from Columbus through Santa Felipe over toward what is now Liberty County today, north of San Jacinto. That belt of settlement will become the primary site of many of the later Texas revolutionary battles that we'll talk about today. But as the Anglo settlements developed, the Mexican national government became incredibly anxious about the political, economic, and cultural turn that Texas was taking towards the United States. What Spain and Mexico hoped was that all of these settlers would come into Texas and they would acculturate. <laughs> They would assimilate into a Spanish or Mexican culture. That expectation included a Catholic mandatory uh, established faith. Most Anglo settlers continued to practice their Methodist or Baptist Protestant faiths or none at all instead. There was a general expectation that these settlers would also acquire facility with Spanish. And in fact, Stephen F. Austin was quite good at this. He learned Spanish, he read and wrote Spanish. He often wrote letters to Americans and Mexican people in Spanish or English, signing them as Esteban, Estebanico. Um, so Stephen F. Austin was acculturating and he generally promoted that sort of uh, Mexicanization of the Anglo settlements himself. Throughout the late 1820s and early 1830s, Stephen F. Austin often functioned as a kind of bridge between the American migrants into Texas and the Mexican government. 
Now, of course, over time, Stephen F. Austin's ability to broker that kind of peace will collapse and he will join the revolutionary movement. But throughout the early 1830s, Stephen F. Austin really does in many ways represent the peace wing or the peace party of the uh, impending division between the Anglo colonists and the Mexican government. In 1830, the Mexican <laughs> national government passed a pretty substantial revision to its immigration laws. Uh, they closed down immigration from the United States. They began to impose taxation on the Anglo colonies, particularly taxation collected at the ports at Anahuac and Velasco and Brazoria. These changes disrupted the uh, migration and commerce of the Anglo settlements. And as you're probably not surprised to hear, they did not welcome this new system of taxation. That new system of taxation also led to the investment of more Mexican soldiers and tax collectors in Texas. One of the big concerns that the Anglo settlers had, of course, was the relationship of Mexico legally to the institution of slavery. Under the Spanish and Mexican governments, slavery was legal. The Mexican Republic, as established in 1824, tended to allow a federal system in which states autonomously made their own rules about immigration, taxation, and slavery. But there were several episodes throughout the 1820s in which the Mexican national government, um, in sort of various ways, began to chip away at with the goal toward ending slavery. Sometimes these would be limited regional emancipations. Sometimes these would be jubilees that came with emancipation. Um, ultimately, the passage of a gradual abolition law that began by closing off Mexico from the importation of new slaves really did threaten the ability of the American settlers in Texas to bring African-American slaves with them. Stephen F. Austin struggled to try and preserve Texas's ability to maintain slavery. Um, often, Stephen F. Austin would negotiate with the Mexican government, and often that would be done with Tejano allies in Texas from San Antonio. What Stephen F. Austin wanted was a grandfather clause or loophole for Texas so that Anglo-Americans could continue to bring slaves into the state. By 1829, this was really impossible, but Stephen F. Austin and the Anglo colonists settled on a apprenticeship system where they would bring African-American slaves into Texas. Technically, legally, they would be free, but they would be required to sign contracts of indenture, sometimes for 30, 50, or 100 years. This virtually guaranteed that African-American slaves would come into Texas and not be genuinely free, but many of the authorities in Texas and Mexico tended to look the other way. And there were a lot of reasons for this. Uh, particularly in San Antonio, the Tejano residents in political positions of authority believed that if they did shut down African-American slavery in Texas, that only the poorest of white Americans would move in, and that this would create a condition by which not only would Texas's population and economy develop more slowly, but that Texas would fill up with kind of vagabond, miscreant, poor white people instead of the elite landholding planter class that had been attracted by cheap land. The ability to kind of skirt the law by bringing in slaves and making them into apprenticeships or servants or indentured uh, bond servants was a, a, a violation of the not just the letter of the law, but of the spirit of the law. Um, now, ultimately, pressure by the Mexican government after 1830 to try and stop slavery in Texas becomes a major factor in the revolt against Mexican authority. In 1832, the colonists hold their first major meeting to debate what issues it had with Mexico, um, particularly these issues related to the new restrictions passed in 1830 on taxation, immigration, and slavery. But after this consultation of 1832 met, uh, the colonists effectively sought to assuage the ideas of Mexico's national government that the Texans were pursuing independence or secession. And Stephen F. Austin's kind of conciliatory message of peace uh, wins out. Over the next couple of years, however, this really does start to change. Um, Stephen F. Austin is building a community in San Felipe. Uh, he'll be appointed as an alcalde, which is a sort of combination of an executive and legislative position at the municipal level. Um, Often casually, this is translated as mayor or judge, but effectively Stephen F. Austin will have authority in the Brazos department of the 
territory of Texas under the New Mexican national government. Uh, San Antonio and Nacogdoches will be the other departments. And ultimately, the goal that Stephen F. Austin has is quite simply the further development of Texas's economy through population growth by attracting immigrants from the United States. Very rapidly, though, things in Mexico start to change. And it provokes a response by some of the newer settlers in Texas. Stephen F. Austin is trying to maintain a kind of stable, harmonious, peaceful movement of American immigrants into Mexico. But in 1833, Santa Ana abridges the Mexican constitution and becomes effectively a dictator in Mexico. Now, for the long history of the Texas Revolution, traditional histories would suggest that the American settlers who came in 1824 under that Republican government of Mexico felt that Santa Ana's grasping of power in 1833 was a violation of the sort of agreement that they had made when they joined Mexico in Texas. And from 1833 forward, tensions between Texas and Mexico escalate, and Santa Ana does become a kind of fixture of those criticisms. Those who begin pushing more for a separation from Mexico or a rebellion against Santa Ana's leadership include people like William Barrett Travis, um, who had traveled by way of uh, Alabama from South Carolina into Texas settled in that region north of Trinity Bay and began leading younger, newer immigrants into Texas into what increasingly will be nicknamed the War Party, people that would like to see Texas more <laughs> secede and become independent. Now, ultimately, those conflicts create a lot of tension with the Mexican national government. Um, and in 1834 and 1835, Stephen F. Austin travels to Mexico in efforts to try and secure toleration or permission for the creation of a Texas state government within the Mexican Confederation. Up to this point, Texas had been a territory, which meant that the administrative capital that made the political decisions about Texas moved about in northern Mexico between the cities of Monclava and Saltillo. Uh, for Anglo residents in Texas, the preference was for local government, a government that was not just local, but was near enough to address their concerns and for Texas statehood to have a Texas capital, presumably in either San Antonio or San Felipe. When Stephen F. Austin journeyed to Mexico to make this case, he was arrested on the Mexican complaint that he sent letters back home to Texas, encouraging to begin the process of building a state government while waiting for permission. Uh, this was viewed as um, presumptuous, perhaps even treasonous, Stephen F. Austin's arrest led to his long-term detention, and that moved Texans closer towards uh, the War Party argument that Texas needed to secede into independence. When, when uh, Stephen F. Austin was released from prison and returned to Texas, um, he had more or less fully converted to the position of the War Party that Texas needed to be revolutionized. Now, in 1835, things, of course, begin to heat up. Uh, in October, the Mexican military commander in San Antonio, General Cos, sent some Mexican soldiers down to the city of Gonzales, where the residents had long held a cannon for the purposes of defending themselves from potential Comanche attacks. When the small detachment of Mexican soldiers traveled to Gonzales and the Mexican soldiers demanded the return of the cannon, you guys know this story. Famously, the American residents at Gonzales refused and said, come and take it. Uh, the Mexican soldiers, unable to secure the cannon by consent of the American settlers, uh, crossed the river and waited. They sent one messenger back to San Antonio asking uh, for confirmation that they were expected to take the cannon by force if necessary. And while waiting for instructions from San Antonio, uh, the American residents at Gonzales attacked this Mexican uh, messenger and force. Now, this is, of course, in October 1835, on October 2nd, the first battle of the Texas Revolution. And in this very small battle, only one Mexican soldier will be killed. There will be no American casualties, but it does represent the beginning of an armed rebellion by Texas residents. Now, very rapidly, this armed rebellion begins to spread. And about a week later, on the city of Goliad, the American residents on that uh, 
mission and township, uh, eject Mexican military forces from Goliad. Now, this is going to separate San Antonio from the Gulf Coast, which will make it very difficult for General Coast, the commander of Mexican forces in San Antonio, to receive reinforcements or supplies from the Gulf Coast of Texas. Once the American rebels have taken control of both Gonzales and Goliad, we really see the beginnings of the war itself, right? The, the Texas Revolution has kind of fully begun. Now, Texans begin to flood into Goliad and Gonzales to hold these cities. And they're aware, of course, that San Antonio is under the control of Mexican General Coast. News about the battles at Gonzales and Goliad spreads through newest newspapers, um, particularly from New Orleans up to the United States through New York. Once news of the rebellion in Texas breaks out, many thousands of Americans begin to pour into Texas uh, to support the Texas Revolution. And very rapidly, you have a new population of Texans. These are not necessarily people that had been connected to the colonization project of the 1820s and 30s under Stephen F. Austin. But instead, they ride into Texas in 1835 in order to support this rebellion. Um, it takes some time for them to arrive. It takes some time for them to be organized. And often these voluntary companies or militias will elect their own captains, and they will join the Americans in Gonzales and Goliad and begin to build up what becomes the foundation of the Army of Texas. Now, in October, on the 28th, Mexican forces from San Antonio ride down to Mission Concepcion, where they attack Americans at the mission, and the Americans prevail. This is a third tremendously important American military victory in October of 1835, and it gives the American rebels a sort of confidence that they have the capacity to win in a battle against the Mexican army. Now, ultimately, this does lead to a series of fairly uh, provocative actions by the Texan volunteers. They capture the Mexican fort um, further down the river from Gonzales. Uh, they engage in November with a fight with the Mexican army as it pursues uh, grass or hay or forage for their armed, uh, for their um, oxen and cattle and horses. Those two battles are again, US American rebel victories. Um, they lead to somewhere between 15 and 20 Mexican casualties and in the midst of these battles, the Army of Texas begins to lay siege to the city of San Antonio. From late October until early December, for a little bit more than eight weeks, the American rebels surround and attack San Antonio until they compel General Coast to surrender. When the Mexican army surrenders the city of San Antonio and evacuates Texas, the state in December of 1835 is now under rebel control. There are no major Mexican officials or military authorities in the state uh, to extend Mexican national power over Texas. And in December of 1835, the rebellion has been viewed as a success. And there is, again, a sort of a tremendous amount of optimism and celebration. What they do not necessarily anticipate is the very rapid return of overwhelming military forces from Mexico in February. But into this gap, we need to spend a small amount of time talking a little bit about Sam Houston. Sam Houston ultimately will be appointed in command of the Texas Armed Forces, but one of the things that we should think about is the role of the United States in fostering the Texas Revolution. Because again, the traditional history of the Texas Revolution is the idea that American settlers established economically productive colonies they had a general desire for uh, American-style freedoms, including freedom of religion, freedom of uh, due process, that the American rebels rebelled against the encroaching dictatorship of Santa Ana, uh, particularly after 1835 when he abolishes the, the, the Mexican Republican Constitution. And yet there is this other story to the Texas Revolution that we really need to think critically about as well. Sam Houston was a man from Tennessee. As a youth, he fought in the US Army in the War of 1812 under Andrew Jackson's command. When Jackson's political star rose and he became president, Sam Houston in Tennessee also became a political acolyte of Jackson's, served in Congress and ran and served as governor. In 
Uh, Sam Houston, to my knowledge, is the only American to become governor of two states. But in his days in Tennessee, he was a solid supporter of Andrew Jackson's. Now, when Sam Houston's political career collapsed, he decided to travel to Oklahoma with Cherokee peoples and lived in Oklahoma at Fort Gibson. As a young soldier in the War of 1812 and as a teenager, he had spent a lot of time with the Cherokee. When the Cherokee were being relocated to Oklahoma by the United States government during the Trail of Tears, Sam Houston decided to go to Oklahoma as well. Now, Jackson appointed Sam Houston to be a federal Indian agent at Fort Gibson, and Sam Houston's particular responsibility working for Jackson was to try and open up Comanche territory to Cherokee settlement. Sam Houston also took a side gig as a real estate speculator working as an agent for a New York City-based company that wanted to purchase land around Galveston Bay. So when Sam Houston enters Texas in 1831, he has deep ties to the Jackson administration as well as New York real estate investors. He does look for land himself to establish a farm and a home, and he very rapidly gets swept up into Texas politics. He joins the war party, becomes a prominent political leader in Texas negotiations in 1835, 1836. And when Texas does ultimately declare independence from Mexico, uh, the Texas interim government appoints Sam Houston to be the general of the U.S. Army. Now, that, of course, raises all kinds of questions. Was Sam Houston appointed because of his experience as a veteran of the War of 1812 and because of his reputational connection to Andrew Jackson? Absolutely, those are strong reasons why Sam Houston would be appointed commander of the armed forces. The question, though, that has kind of bedeviled historians for quite a long time is to what degree Andrew Jackson's foreign policy was being implemented by his mentee, Samuel Houston, in Texas. Uh, many of you know that Jackson had, for example, personally led an armed invasion into Florida, which led to the annexation of Florida from Spain. Jackson also had supported Cherokee removal, which Sam Houston uh, participated in. And in Texas, the policy of annexation of Texas that would follow the Texas Revolution was certainly something that Houston and Jackson favored. So to what degree was the Texas Revolution simply one of many steps on the long process of United States territorial expansion from Florida to Texas ultimately to California, um, failed attempts at Cuba. Throughout the 19th century, the United States was constantly expanding. Uh, and to portray Texas as a kind of spontaneous rebellion of people seeking freedom is a very different historical explanatory narrative than suggesting that it is just yet another step on the acquisition of territory by the United States in which Sam Houston is effecting Jacksonian policy. Nonetheless, Sam Houston will support the decision to move towards independence, and he will be appointed the uh, commander of the forces of the Texas Revolution. Now, in 1835, the volunteers that had really formed the Army of Texas, that had swept into San Antonio and captured the capital, um, these soldiers, these volunteers, were not under Sam Houston's authority and control. He effectively needed to recruit a new professional Texas Army. Uh, an army that was more or less parallel to the volunteers. Many of those volunteers did ultimately join Sam Houston's army, but when Sam Houston arrived in the major cities and sites of conflict at Gonzales or Goliad or San Antonio, his general message was that holding these frontier positions was less strategically necessary than defending the settlements on the Brazos and Colorado rivers. Sam Houston preferred that the defenders in the West would fall back to the settlements in the East. And ultimately in 1835, that's gonna be the general sort of military policy of Sam Houston in command. He does, however, leave James Bowie and James Fannin, excuse me, in, excuse me, in Goliad and in San Antonio uh, to make local decisions about what to do next as the war unfolds. Now, Bowie and William Barrett Travis will ultimately share command at the Battle of the Alamo when the Mexican army approaches. Uh, James Fannin will be in charge of uh, military forces at, uh, at Goliad. Now, the Mexican military threat 
which is fast approaching, arrives in Texas as early as crossing into Texas in January and February. That military progress includes the movement of two major armies. Uh, President Santa Ana himself leads an army across the Rio Grande River, crossing into South Texas and marching directly to San Antonio. Now, a secondary, smaller, and subordinate army under the command of General Urea will leave Matamoros and cross into Texas and march towards Goliad. When Santa Ana's army arrives in San Antonio, February of 1836, they begin to lay siege to the city. They take the city of San Antonio, and the Alamo defenders will be the last sort of um, assembly of Texas rebels in San Antonio. Now, the nearly 200 or so defenders at the Alamo who Santa Anta lay siege to are the remnants of the Army of Texas that had swept into San Antonio only in December. Many of them had decided to leave San Antonio after that military victory in December and travel toward Goliad and toward Matamoros under the command of volunteers Johnson and Grant. That so-called Goliad campaign was an effort by Texas rebels to take the offensive and began moving down towards Mexico to pursue its independence. As General Urea's army moved north, it met that Goliad um, expedition, and there were a series of fairly minor battles at San Patricio, Agua Dolce, and Refugio, where General Urea's army virtually wiped out Johnson and Grant's armies. Now, many of those men were killed, many of them were taken prisoner, and many of them were installed in prison at Goliad. This, however, left San Antonio very undersupplied and underdefended. Sam Houston's strategy was to abandon San Antonio. And as the Texas Army marched eastward, it left behind a very small number of men at San Antonio and Goliad. Now, most people, of course, are very familiar with the story of the Alamo. After a 13 day siege, the Alamo falls to Mexican military forces. Um, Santa Ana declares no quarter. Every defender at the Alamo will be killed in battle or executed after being detained as prisoners. And ultimately, after the defeat of the Alamo, Santa Ana will direct his military forces to divide. Some go south to Goliad to support General Urea's campaign to capture that mission, a campaign that is a Mexican military success when James Fannin is defeated at the Battle of Colito Creek. Now, Santa Ana himself begins leading forces eastward in an attempt to catch the Texas government in rebellion. Um, during the siege of the Alamo, uh, Texas' Texas's, uh, political leaders had met at Washington on the Brazos and declared independence. Now, that declaration of independence really did, you know, frustrate and irritate Santa Ana. And in pursuit of the Texas government, Santa Ana learned that they had fled south and eastward towards Galveston. Santa Ana had a decision to make. Does he pursue Sam Houston's army? Does he pursue the government in retreat? Um, ultimately, Santa Ana heads towards Galveston and ultimately fails to catch the Texas rebellion government as it reached Galveston Bay and sailed away from uh, the sort of confluence of the Buffalo Bayou and Trinity Bays. Now, Sam Houston had previously marched the Texas Army Okay, I eastward. guess I'm in. Yes, I hear a lecture. Yes, you are. Yes, we can hear you. Pardon me one second. Thank you. That uh, march eastward by Sam Houston's army um, ultimately brought him to Trinity Bay as well. Uh, the process of marching eastward from the Colorado to the Brazos to Trinity Bay was, for Sam Houston, an effort at forcing the Mexican army to extend its supply lines. By extending its supply lines, that would give the Texas army an advantage. One speculative argument about Sam Houston's strategy also was that he was attempting to draw the Mexican army as close to Louisiana as possible. Should the Texas army engage Mexican soldiers on the Louisiana border, there was a general expectation that the Americans in rebellion could count on U.S. military forces intervening. And in fact, Jackson's United States had already begun mobilizing U.S. forces in Louisiana. That did not unfold. Sam Houston did not bring the Mexican army all the way to the Louisiana border, but instead they met at the field at San Jacinto. 
Now, in that fight, when Sam Houston arrived earlier than the Mexican army, uh, they took the field at, pardon me while I jump a couple of slides here. They take the field at the Battle of San Jacinto under an oak grove, which allows the Texans to have shelter and some sort of um, high ground from the approaching Mexican army. When Santa Army's forces reach the battle site, uh, they have marched a very long way from San Antonio. It is mid-afternoon, it is quite late. Santa Ana sends a kind of advanced force of Mexican soldiers into the field. Uh, the Mexican uh, reconnaissance and the Texas forces have a couple of limited skirmishes, uh, and there is no major battle. Santa Ana's expectation was that that major battle would likely have occurred um, the next day, April 22nd, at, at dawn perhaps, where both the Texas and Mexican armies would march out in formation and fight a kind of traditional Napoleonic style shooting fight. Uh, that did not happen, of course. Sort of famously, in the afternoon of April 21st, while Santa Ana had given an order to his soldiers to rest for the battle the next day, most of the Mexican soldiers had begun building camp. Uh, they built some pretty hasty and maybe pathetic uh, sort of breastworks to protect their campsite. Many of the men were sleeping, many of them were doing laundry, others of them were cooking. And uh, around 4 p.m. in the afternoon, Sam Houston gave the author the, the order to attack. Now, the Battle of San Jacinto lasted for about 18 minutes. And after getting off one volley, the American rebellion forces attacked the Mexican campsite uh, the Mexican soldiers, many of whom were undressed and many of them were unarmed, fled. Uh, about a third of the forces were killed on the battle site. Reports that the Texas Army continued to catch and kill prisoners of war all the way until sundown for the next two or three hours uh, increased the death toll to several hundred. Um, estimates are anywhere from six to 700 Mexican prisoners were executed at the battlefield. This has been tended to be dismissed as the consequence of undisciplined soldiers seeking revenge uh, for the death and destruction of the Alamo and Goliad. Um, but ultimately, Sam Houston in frustration tried to staunch the killing of Mexican soldiers and the battle and the killing of prisoners and soldiers ended largely around sunset. Now the next day, commanders like Santa Ana and General Coast were caught, they surrendered, uh, they began the process of negotiating treaties, known as the Treaties of Velasco, in which Santa Ana would uh, surrender military control in Texas. He would be obligated to return to Mexico to pursue Mexican recognition of Texas's independence. Um, ultimately, the Texas government refused to surrender Santa Ana back to Mexico, which is a, sort of a, a violation of these unratified treaties, which remained, uh, as a result, not in legal force. The Mexican national government uh, determined that nothing Santa Ana negotiated was legally binding, and Mexico would not recognize Texas's independence. Now, ultimately, however, this battle at San Jacinto was the last major military battle of the war. Um, Santa Ana's capture and surrender, uh, the destruction of most of his army, and the imprisonment of the remainder left General Filasola with the responsibility of marching these soldiers back to Mexico, which he complied with. And when General Filisola vacated Texas with the remnants of Santa Ana's army, um, by April 1836, the war was over. Uh, you see a couple of fairly famous flags here that depict the military victories uh, of, of the Battle of San Jacinto. Uh, this is a much later 1880s painting of Sam Houston in repose with a war injury negotiating Santa Ana's surrender under the oak tree at San Jacinto. Um, Santa, Santa, excuse me, Santa, Santa Ana would be with most of the remnants of the Mexican army transported from San Antonio, uh, from, excuse me, from San Jacinto down to the Brazos River port um, at Velasco where the treaties would be signed. But in 1836, when this war was over, very rapidly, Texans began asking, what next? They held a series of elections and referendums in July and September to create a new national government. Uh, the initial proposal by referendum was whether or not Texas wanted to join the United States. 
move from being a Mexican territory to a U.S. state. And overwhelmingly, that referendum validated the desire of the Texas revolutionaries to join the USA. It took quite a long time. The negotiation of annexation between the United States and Texas uh, dragged on with fits and starts. And uh, by about nine years, it took to annex Texas. But ultimately, the decision was to annex Texas to the United States as soon as possible. And when the United States made that uh, a lengthier and often frustrating process, establishing a national government in Texas really was plan B. But in establishing that national government of Texas, the Texans did elect Sam Houston to be their first president. They had a kind of interesting structure of government based on the US Constitution, but out of concern for the kind of aggrandizement of too much power in the hands of one person, uh, presidents could not be elected consecutively which left Sam Houston able to serve as the first and third president of the United States. When the fourth president, Anson Jones, was negotiating the Treaty of Annexation with Texas, uh, Sam Houston was not qualified to serve as president for a consecutive term. But as soon as Texas joined the United States, he was elected as a governor and eventually as a U.S. senator. Um, so a long political career would follow Sam Houston after his victories at the Battle of San Jacinto. But all that's to say that there are a couple of things that we really need to reckon with. Um, for example, um, historians frequently want to know how we evaluate the causes of the revolution. I think in hindsight, most people would suggest that when the population becomes over 80 to 90 percent Anglo-American immigrants into Texas, more than 50,000 Americans living in the state, that the drift of the state towards a political or economic union with the United States um, seems quite inevitable. And considering the steady expansion of the United States westward, that only adds to the sort of seeming inevitability of Texas's revolution and annexation. However, with that being said, that kind of inevitable march of history as one explanation, it is, I think, very traditional in Texas to portray this as an act of free people asserting their freedom in the face of Mexican tyranny. I do, however, want to qualify that because as it is important to note that Americans in the Austin colonies certainly did chafe at changing regulations regarding immigration, taxation, and slavery, it was largely Americans who came into Texas in 1835 who joined the military and waged the war were certainly people in the war party like Houston and Travis that had been in Texas for years pushing for independence. But the war itself was waged by soldiers and volunteers who primarily entered Texas in 1835 after news of Gonzales. So the people who fought and successfully won this war were a very distinct population compared to the people who had colonized and lived in Texas for more than 15 years. And I think that matters. Because what that does suggest is that the war for Texas independence was waged by soldiers who saw this as an a, a opportunity to annex more territory for the United States. That's a very different cause or motivation than people fighting simply to assert their abstract rights to personal freedoms and liberty. Another question I think that we really need to reckon with is the sort of impact that the Texas Revolution had on Anglo and Mexican relationships inside Texas. Um, I'll give you an example of where this debate unfolds. Many people critical of the Texas revolutionaries would assert that people like Travis and Bowie and Houston and Austin were essentially negative in their views and behavior toward Mexican peoples, that they saw the Catholic faith as inferior to Protestantism that they saw the Mexican government and military as inferior to the USA. That sometimes this sentiment included a belief that the Mexican people were somehow inferior to the United States, whether that was because of culture or race or history. But ultimately in the 1820s and 30s, what you actually see is a tremendous amount of respectful collaboration between Anglo and Latino peoples in Texas. James Christ, who studied at Rice and Yale, studied endlessly the documents from the Texas era before the Alamo, 
And James Crisp's conclusions, I think, are fairly persuasive. Most volatile and sometimes racist anti-Mexican attitudes find expression after the massacres at the Alamo and Goliad, and particularly are expressed by Americans who move into Texas after the revolution. And what that means often is in Texas, in the nine years in which it is a republic, you will see an extraordinary increase in anti-Mexican conduct by individuals, as well as the national government itself. Uh, this includes dispossession of Mexican nationals of their land. It includes efforts to move Mexican Texans out of places like Nacogdoches, San Antonio, and Victoria. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of just simple prejudice in action as Anglo residents in Texas begin to mistreat Mexican Texans and, Tex and Tejanos living in Texas. That historical uh, sort of notion that it was racism against Mexicans that motivated the revolution uh, seems to actually be unfounded in the documentary record. Instead, most of that anti-Mexican sentiment emerges during and after the war rather than before the war. So that matters, right? That's hugely important. There are, of course, a couple of other really famous stories that we need to talk about, right? Besides the big legacy of the Alamo or the big legacy of San Houston, we've got to go back here and let me bring uh, the story of Davy Crockett back into focus. Uh, like Sam Houston, Davy Crockett kind of emerges from the Texas Revolution as a mythical hero of the American West. Like Jackson and Houston, he is a Tennessee politician. Unlike Sam Houston, uh, Davy Crockett had been a pretty strong critic of Andrew Jackson's. Uh, Jackson's popularity meant that Davy Crockett's political star began to dim. And when Davy Crockett lost his political influence in Congress and went back into a sort of private life, uh, he developed a reputation instead as a frontier marksman, hunter, trapper, and explorer. A kind of symbol of American Western frontier spirit in buckskins. When the Texas Revolution erupts after the Battle of Gonzales, Davy Crockett leads a small group of volunteers into Texas to participate in the war. He finds himself swept up in the Siege of Behar. He lives in San Antonio in 1835 and 36. And when the Mexican army approaches, he will find himself in the Alamo. Now, the traditional portrayal of Davy Crockett is that, of course, he was an American hero and he defended the Alamo where he died fighting the Mexican army's attempt to destroy the Texas rebellion. In the 1950s and 60s, particularly Davy Crockett was portrayed by the Disney TV show and the John Wayne film as a kind of representative of heroic martial American manhood. Uh, a Davy Crockett who would never consider surrendering, much less being captured as a prisoner of war. Nonetheless, in the 1950s and 70s, um, translations and discoveries of documents in Spanish written by Mexican soldiers and commanders describe a Alamo destruction that included the likely detention of five to six defenders who were disarmed, defeated, and taken prisoner. One of those officers who was responsible for the capture of these American Alamo defenders uh, was a guy by the name of General Castrillon. They took these Alamo defenders before Santa Ana as prisoners of war, in which Santa Ana then ordered their execution, and they were killed by bayonet. There were many eyewitnesses to this, several of them which identified Davy Crockett. Early news reports of the Alamo fall described Davy Crockett being killed after the battle as an executed soldier. You can even find some 19th century books illustrating Davy Crockett's murder by Santa Ana's uh, bayonet corps. So in the 19th century, it was generally widely understood that Davy Crockett did not fight and die in battle, but instead was executed as a prisoner of war. Um, nonetheless, the publication of a uh, Mexican soldier's journals about this execution and the larger war itself uh, triggered a big controversy in the 1980s and 90s as people began to argue and of course, an American hero like Davy Crockett would never surrender, nor would he ever be caught. Instead, he would die fighting, swinging old Bess, even if he had run out of bullets. Um, but I do think that the responsible history largely 
leads to the inevitable conclusion that Davy Crockett was murdered while in prison, while, while, while captive. Now, for those who want to elevate the heroism of the American defenders at the Alamo or the victors at San Jacinto, this sort of essentially requires uh, the increased villainy of Santa Ana. And, and I see no reason at all why Santa Ana's order to execute disarmed prisoners of war wouldn't contribute to that narrative of Santa Ana as the arch villain of the story. But nonetheless, there are a lot of Americans who are deeply committed to preserving the idea that Davy Crockett did not surrender and therefore was not executed after the battle. Uh, but that, that kind of controversy touches all kinds of issues about the Alamo, the Texas Revolution, and symbolic men like Crockett and Sam Houston as representatives not of history but of American mythology. This is a story, a story of patriotism, a story of nationalism, a story of heroes, um, heroes which can be, you know, uncritically good portrayed in statues and paintings and films. For historians, though, it's really important to get the history right, rely on facts, on reason, on evidence, take into consideration context, take into consideration Mexican sources. Um, all of that matters. All of that is important. And so when thinking about the Texas Revolution as a whole, I will leave you with a reference to the Battle of San Jacinto historical marker. Should you ever make a trip out to the Battle of San Jacinto battleground, I would encourage you to do this. There's a kind of remarkable obelisk at the base of which is a really, really quite good museum. And on that obelisk is carved a statement about the battle as one of the most important battles in US and potentially world history. If not for Sam Houston's victory at the Battle of San Jacinto, Texas would not have secured its independence from Mexico. And if not for that independence, Texas would not have been annexed by the United States, which would not have triggered the war with Mexico that led to the California annexation. Nearly one half of Mexican territory was annexed by the United States between 1836 and 1848. And the Battle of San Jacinto is absolutely key to that continental transition where this territory from the Gulf Coast to the Bay Area comes under the United States' flag. It is absolutely one of the most consequential battles in world history. All right, let me stop there. And if anyone here should happen to have any questions, I'd be glad to hear your comments, your thoughts, or try the best that I can to answer your questions as you have them. Can you hear me? I was going to jump in. I really enjoyed the presentation. And uh, Mr. Jim, I hope, I think once they post the link, once you just click on it, I think you'll be able to watch it and listen. It was very informative. But one of the things I learned uh, was the fact, I didn't know this, that Sam Houston couldn't run again. So that was why there was the pause. Yeah. So the, I thought the, that was interesting. Yeah, the Texas Constitution did not allow someone to run for president back to back. You could, in theory, take turns with somebody and be president every other term. But uh, by the time the fourth president ran around, uh, we were annexing. You know, I didn't know Sam Houston's wife died and she's buried at um, where the Rose Aquarium is in that town. Well, now this may be, we can just gossip a little bit about Sam Houston. Sam Houston had uh, three wives. Um, I would encourage people to read a little bit about his first wife's marriage. He got married when he was quite a young politician in Tennessee. And after a weekend, he sent her back to her father, said, this isn't going to work. And uh, there was a lot of gossip about what happened. Some people accused her of adultery or maybe being in love with someone else, and he would squash any of that negative criticism of her. He wouldn't tolerate that. He would threaten to duel people who criticized her. Other people that were critical of Sam Houston suggested that his war injuries from the Battle of Horseshoe Bend made him unfit to be a husband, which is like, it's a pretty strong, you know, allegation that, that Sam Houston couldn't have children. 
and so his first marriage ended in quite some scandal. Um, when he lived in Oklahoma at Fort Gibson, he had a Cherokee wife. They lived in common law and under Cherokee marriage standards. Her name was Diana or Tiana, sometimes spelled with a D or a T. He didn't remarry Margaret, his third and final wife, until after Diana died. And so when he was in Texas, he did marry a, a, a second white woman, I guess his third wife. And Sam Houston and Margaret had several children. He predeceased her, but they lived in that corridor between Huntsville and, and, and Washington on the Brazos. Uh, their house is a, is got a marker, but I think it's privately owned now. And it was near the original site of Baylor before Baylor pushed up the Brazos to Waco. So there's a lot of sort of Sam Houston sites that you can go visit with Sam and Margaret up on, on north of Huntsville. So uh, it wasn't that he couldn't have children then. He did with Margaret. So whatever problem he had was solved or not real. Yeah, I, I don't really entertain the idea that he was unable to have kids. I think that was political slander, just an attempt to embarrass and criticize and gossip about him. But, but he, must, he, <laughs> he must have really loved and cared for the uh, Indian wife. Yeah, the the general the general story of their relationship is that uh, when he moved to Texas, she just refused to come with him. She just she was like, "Nope, I'm on the reservation with my family." They they ran a store in Fort Gibson together. Fort Gibson was a U.S. Army camp in the northeast corner of Oklahoma, and so when he uh, when he came into Texas in '31, he just left her there to run the store, and they didn't have children. Uh, and he did not marry Margaret until Diana had passed away. So some people suggest that was out of love and respect, as, as you suggest, that he was honoring Diana and didn't marry again until she was gone. Hmm. Well, thank you very much. It was very interesting. Thank you, Catherine and Kathleen, both of you. Thank you. Not, not, not too long ago, my wife and I went to uh, uh, Independence with mm -hmm. another couple. Uh, and there was there's a museum there. It's a which, remarkable uh, museum. Yeah. Oh, uh, Baptist Church, mm -hmm. and uh, and it had markers in there and some things that were that he carved his initials or something in the pew and mm -hmm. and that he was baptized in that creek right behind it. That's that, right. That, I think I remember some of that stuff. Now there is a there's a story about Sam Houston when he was in Congress. You know, he served in Congress from both Texas and Tennessee, and he did like to whittle. He did like to carve things, and he would carve flowers out of wood or out of, you know, soapstone or whatever he could find and give them to ladies. And and I definitely remember this one British woman who was traveling and received one of these little carved flowers and you know, you could just hear her eyes rolling in her descriptions of Sam Houston's efforts to flirt with her in his old age or whatever but but up at independence there is a really good museum there's also a replica of the hall where they declared independence and as you say there's an uh, there's a 19th century church there um out at san felipe on the brazos where stephen f austin lived there is a new very good museum there as well i would if you haven't been out to stephen f austin park or san felipe historical site there's a good museum there as well. And that's close. That's not far. That's 30, 30 minutes from Rosenberg. Yeah, well, I've, I've been there before, you know, many years ago before uh, before they built a new one. I, I hear that they they built a new one, but I hadn't I hadn't been there. Uh, yeah, the, the director of that museum is on the Fort Bend County Historical Commission with me. And actually, it's possible he's on that Columbus or Austin County Historical Commission, and he just spends a lot of time visiting ours. But since the pandemic, I haven't really been able to see any of the Historical Commission folks in person. Everything's just email. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of great stuff nearby. Absolutely. Yeah, well, we we make a tour every so often, my wife and I. We, we have a ranch in Columbus, too, that mm -hmm. that uh, yeah. and there's a lot of a lot of things going on around there. People. Yeah, you guys have that little wacky castle in the courthouse square there. That little, uh, you've got the park in the courthouse center of town with a little medieval castle, which is a very strange little building. <laughs> now, my kids are 14 and 21, and I dragged them all over the place and 
and and you know they grumble they grumble but whatever you got to do that when you have kids take well, them that, out to these places yeah they'll, they'll remember it later on exactly <laughs> that it was <Exactly>. interesting <laughs> well thank you jim okay thank you